Lords of the Black Banner, a Mongolian epic. Fractured Empire, Book Two. Written by Star Z Davies. Narrated by David Wiseman. Dedicated to Professor Kyle Fingerson for opening the door to this amazing discovery. Did we not shed enough blood in the name of peace and unity? We cannot relinquish ourselves to the enemies of the Mongol state. If we break the rules of the great Genghis, all doors of destruction will be opened. High heavens have mercy for the fate of the wolves. Lady Mandukai Chapter 1 Salted Tea and Rumors Monke Bulag, Summer, 1468 Mandukai sat in dust saddle on the hill to the east of Monke Bulag, closed her eyes, and tilted her head back to bask in the sunlight. A warm breeze caressed her skin and ruffled her deal around her ankles. Three years had passed since her vision of Genghis Khan, three years since losing the only child she had conceived, a bitter failure that still stung deep in her heart. Three years during which she had acted as a faithful wife, more than she had before her vision. Mondul was not her future, the vision made that clear enough, and that knowledge offered endless comfort. It made pleasing him much less painful. She did not know when the winds would change, but she could feel them coming as surely as the wind against her skin. During those three years, Mandukai's wisdom and level head had earned trust and loyalty from several officers in Mandul's camp. While Mandul was not blind to Mandukai's part in court, he did not know how much loyalty she had acquired through his men. He would die and leave her widowed one day, as Genghis Khan had hinted in her vision. She had to be prepared to protect herself and Asige, as well as Monke Bulag. Today, as every day, Mandukai rode dust up to the hilltop and observed how Monke Bulag had swelled in size. Domed gares dotted the horizon in clumps. More tribes and families joined the great Khan as Bayon, Vice Chancellor Asama, and Unabulid continued their mission along the Ming border. Jalayir families were among the first to join the great Khan in Monke Bulag and they had assimilated so well into the encampment that Mandukai could no longer tell where their tribe ended and the Borjan tribe began. They, along with the Korlod and Korchin, who had joined the Khan in the early days of Monke Bulag, had become part of the Borjan in a way that the other tribes had not yet managed. The Jalayir commander, Alton, continued along the borders with her Tumen to keep away enemies of the Khan, and for the best as well. Alton had been a rough influence on Asige, giving the princess notions of battle and glory that she could never fulfill, simply because she was a princess. Mandukai thought back to when she had first arrived in Monke Bulag four years ago. It had been a fairly small capital, consisting only of the remaining Borjan, along with a few thousand Korchin and Korlod loyal to Unabulid and Togachi. Now, Mandul had three more tribes under his wing in the makeshift capital. Monke Bulag served as a hub to nearly 40,000 Mongols spread across the northern steppe. Not all the families had come to Monke Bulag out of loyalty to the Great Khan. A few Uyghur and Asid milled among the tribes. While Mandul maintained peace between the tribes, some tensions remained high, particularly between the Uyghur and Korchin. Mandul had moved their sections of the capital as far from each other as he could to avoid any mishaps. Mandukai, too, swelled with pride to see their numbers grow. While she was uncertain what the future held for her, she knew she would need as many tribes united behind the conship as possible to face whatever would come. Dust bent his neck to graze on the sparse grass. Mandukai stroked his neck and loosened her grip on the reins to lessen the resistance. Her two guards lingered nearby, close enough to protect her, but far enough to give her privacy. It had been hard to teach them such lessons when Mandul had first assigned six new guards to protect her after Nergui's murder. 
and losing her child. The attempted assassination had put Mondul on edge, and he worried one guard would never be enough. Mandukai now had to walk with two men always in her shadow, day and night. They had taken their role as her guards seriously, constantly crowding so near to her they felt more like a stifling suit of armor than her guards. Mandul had insisted on their endless presence, and it took her the better part of a year to train the six of them on how to afford her the space she needed without smothering her or disobeying Mandul's commands. Failure would be certain death, and such a penalty would motivate them far more than anything she could offer. A single rider raced in her direction, making the guards stiffen in defense. Mandukai easily identified Asige by the streaming hair rippling in the wind and the effortless way she rode her horse. The girl she once knew had transformed into a stunning young woman. At fourteen, marriage wouldn't be far off in her future, but so far the girl had scorned every boy who had made an advance. Asige's spirit was as fierce and wild as Mandukai's own, and it filled Mandukai with great pride. Marriage seemed a poor fate for a girl who could fight just as well as many of the men. But she was a princess, a niece of the great Khan, and she would have as little choice in the matter as Mandukai had herself, possibly less. Out of respect for Asige's uninhibited spirit, Mandukai became just as selective about the man Asige would someday marry. None of them were good enough. Mother! Asige called out with open enthusiasm as she reined her mount in hard enough to make it buck beneath her. Her face was flush with excitement and youth. Have I lost such a flush? Does your uncle know you've ridden out again? Mandukai asked, amused at the exhilaration on Asige's face. Whenever the girl called her mother, it filled Mandukai's heart to the brim. Asige was the only child she had not failed. Yet. Mandukai had not found many to love in her life so far, but Asige certainly ranked high above the others. It had little to do with Asige's spying skills, and more to do with how spirited and warm the girl was around her. The bond between them was stronger than Mandukai had ever felt with anyone else. Asige was the only salve on Mandukai's wounded soul. Who cares? Asige grinned devilishly, controlling her labored breathing after the hard ride. I have to prepare myself for the inevitable. Mandukai raised a brow sharply at her, though inside she struggled to keep her pride from overflowing. And what inevitability would that be? Asige's mare danced but the girl effortlessly reined the mount to obey. That one day I will face a man who challenges me, and I cannot make it easy for him. If a man cannot capture me, he cannot have me. Despite her best efforts to keep a cool face, Mandukai couldn't help but smirk a little at this. Capture the bride was a common practice among nobles. The bride would be placed on the mount of her choice and given a brief head start before her suitor would give chase. His job was to catch her and pull her onto his horse before they crossed the finish line. It was a way to show that the bride was worthy of her husband and that he was strong enough to be worthy of her. For Mandukai's marriage to Mandul, this tradition had been skipped in favor of a swift union. Mandukai knew Asige wouldn't need the head start. In fact, she felt great sympathy for the man who would have to capture the young woman. You know these things are not quite that simple, Mandukai said. It's a formality, not a necessity. I will not end up like my sister. Asige's demeanor shifted, and a fire burned in her dark eyes. Mandukai flinched. Borgchen had sent multiple messages to Mandukai through her trusted spy, Seguse, and she continued to do her part keeping a close eye on Biggerson. However, only twice since Biggerson took her away from them had Borgchen returned to visit. By that time, her son Nemeku had been just old enough to ride a foal while tied to the saddle. 
The good news had been that Biggerson had enemies amongst his own men. Borgchin had seized the opportunity to make those men her spies and allies. It offered some comfort to know that those men would protect her, to their final breath, from outside forces and from her own husband. I also came to fetch you, Asige said, pulling Mondukai from her thoughts. The ladies Satai and Joghan have invited you to tea. Mandukai groaned inwardly. She got along quite well with Joghan. Togachi's young wife was close to her own age, and the two often walked the capital together. Around Satai, Mandukai felt a bit more guarded. Satai's husband, Unike, served as one of Mandul's advisors, and the older woman seemed to think this entitled her to make demands of her queen. Mandukai wouldn't trust Satai at all if the woman didn't have an outright and visible scorn for Yeke. By Satai's estimation, Yeke was a Uyghur and not worthy of being a great Khan's wife, let alone a queen. Mandukai would need women such as Satai on her side when the inevitable came. So, she suffered through the woman's company. <sighs> Very well. Mandukai heaved out a sigh and turned dust toward the camp. You will join us, Asige scoffed. No insult intended, mother, but I will not. She turned her own mount to ride beside Mandukai. The guards trailed behind them. Lady Satai infuriates me, and I'm afraid that one of these days I'll throw a knife into her mouth and make sure she swallows it. Hardly the actions of a princess, Mandukai said tersely, though her heart wasn't in it. She couldn't fault the Sige's frustration. I never asked to be one. You would be worse off if you weren't. This lulled a Sige into silence as they approached the fields of white gares and turned toward the area of camp where Satai's gare rested. Were a Sige not the niece of the great Khan, she would have either been forced into a marriage arrangement already enslaved for some unchecked insult to one of the men in camp, or dead, possibly for much the same reason. The sun burned high in the wide blue sky. Monke Bulag buzzed with activity as men bartered with each other to exchange goods. Women pounded wool into felt or carried water or various goods from one place to the next, and children ran between gares with sticks and pretended to sword fight. Everyone parted for the queen as she passed, and Mandukai inclined her head in gratitude. Since the capital had grown, Mandukai and Mandul had instituted designated pits for slop and excrement away from the gares. Disease was a serious threat with so many gathered. Ever since those pits had been moved away from the gares, the stench of filth had lessened and allowed a pleasant breeze to blow through Monke Bulag without causing one to cover their nose and mouth. The air was fresher, tinged with sweat, leather, and the occasional whiff of cooked mutton. Satai's home rested in the center of her own tribe's segment of Monke Bulag. The exterior's white canvas walls were adorned with the blue of the Borgian, though they were not Borgian themselves. Satai stretched her hand to display such colors, proclaiming her family and her people as the direct extension of the great Khan with the blue ribbons along white. Asige shifted in her saddle. Please don't make me do this, she hissed. She sagged in her saddle as they approached Satai's gear. I'll do anything. I'll pound felt for a week. Asige often shirked her responsibility to learn the art of creating felt, coming up with any excuse she could to get out of the tedious, exhausting task. You know as well as I do that she will expect you to be present, Mandukai said. Asige grimaced. I, I know, uh, but you can make some excuse for my absence. And why should I do such a thing? Mandukai teased. If I must suffer this, you will be right beside me. I would rather be plunged into a frozen river. Mandukai shot a warning glare at Asige as they drew close enough to see Satai's serving girl standing outside the door waiting for them. To Asige's credit, she sat up straighter and raised her chin. 
They arrived beside the front door and handed the reins over to the serving girl as they dismounted. A sige ducked into the gear behind Mandukai. The inside of the gear was brightly lit with lanterns hanging from the ceiling lathes, and the smoke hole opened to the sky. Mandukai had been in this gear a hundred times before, but each time an extra detail caught her attention. As she inclined her head to offer a polite greeting to the hostess, Mandukai noticed the new mattress on the floor opposite the bed that doubled as a sofa. Curled up on the new mattress, Satai's two-year-old son, Olog, slumbered. Seeing the young boy so close to the age her own child would have been opened the wound on her heart. Mandukai swallowed the lump that swelled in her throat and averted her gaze. Satai enjoyed displaying her husband's wealth, and she often acquired new baubles to set on the altar against the northern wall or on the dish shelves beside the altar. Compared to most gares aside from Mandul's, Yeke's, and Mandukai's, this one placed opulence on exhibit. Somehow it always smelled of fresh herbs. That calmed Mandukai's nerves. Lady Mandukai! Satai trilled once Mandukai offered her formal greeting. I'm so pleased you made it. Mandukai didn't believe Satai had doubted her attendance. It would be rude of me to refuse when I had no other pressing matters to attend. Satai's hair was drawn up off her neck and adorned with silver chains and bells that chimed with each movement. The silver highlighted the few strands of gray in her dark hair. Her husband had served under Mondul in the first year of his conship, when they rode against the men responsible for killing the Borgian princes before him. Satai was Unike's reward for the battle won, a woman of low noble birth whose first husband had died in the fight. Having no children with her first husband, Satai went willingly with Unike when he had claimed her. Mandukai couldn't understand such women who would just give themselves to any man who staked a claim on them. Having been married and widowed, Satai was older than Mandukai by at least ten years. She and Unike had only Alog, and Satai doted on the boy too much. He would become a weak warrior if Unike didn't put a stop to Satai's doting soon. Satai had a table set near the center of the gear. Jog Han rose from her seat and smiled brightly at her friend as Mandukai entered. Jog Han had a stunning smile that could light up a gear. Unlike Satai, who put her wealth and power on display and expected lesser men and women to defer to her husband's superior rank, Jog Han remained humble and grateful for all that she had. She hailed from the Jalair tribe, and within a year of arriving in Monke Bulag, had caught Togachi's attention. Mandukai had enjoyed watching their romance blossom, even envied it. Jog Han was a young, beautiful girl of sixteen when she had married Togachi, and the celebration had been a festive event. Within a year, they had their first son, Torudur. Now, Joghan was pregnant with their second child. Why do they get two, when I could not even have one? Mandukai thought sadly, as she noticed how large Joghan's stomach had become. She was happy for her friend's good fortune, but it stung as a bitter reminder of what she had lost. Even after three years of searching, they still had not uncovered the man Alton, who had hired that serving girl to poison her and her child. Mandukai had given up hope years ago that they would ever find him. Please sit, Joghan, Mandukai said, feeling bad that the other woman had stood for her in the first place with her stomach as large as it was. Joghan breathed a sigh of relief as she sat back down. Princess Asige, Joghan said politely. Asige offered a sugary sweet smile and swept into the room with all the grace of a queen. Despite being just shy of fourteen years, she didn't wait for Satai to invite her to sit before claiming her place at the table, an obvious display of her rank over this older woman, and the action drew a tight-lipped grimace from Satai that Asige no doubt enjoyed. Once they were all seated, 
A serving girl poured each of them a cup of salted tea. Satai drank first, a sign that the tea was safe. Mandukai had grown cautious since losing her child after drinking poisoned tea, a fact that everyone in the Mongol nation seemed to know about now. Asige raised her cup and breathed in the fumes, then set the cup down without taking a drink. The action seemed curious to Mandukai, but as she took her first drink, she instantly understood Asige's hesitation. It was strong and bitter. Much like Satai, Mandukai mused. Their hostess made small talk through the first cup of tea and engaged them in mundane conversation. Rumors and gossip, all of which Satai absorbed eagerly from every source and would later pour out like water from a bucket over anyone who would listen. Mandukai found this task both tiresome and troublesome. One day Satai's rumors would stir up true trouble. I overheard a weaker woman talking about the return of the men who went south last year, Satai said casually. Do you know of this, my lady? Mandukai sipped slowly to consider her answer. She knew Mandul had sent a messenger to Asama, but he had not told her to what end. The mission along the border had been Asama's plan. Send Bayon the Golden Prince to stir up rebellion among the Ming-controlled Mongols, cautiously, so the Great Khan could raise the Black Banner, sweep in, and reclaim their land and people, further unifying the fractured empire. It was a surprisingly clever plan which Asama had orchestrated quite efficiently. From what she had heard, so far Bayon had done well in his task. It should not have surprised her. The Golden Prince had a tongue to match his namesake and could easily pull others into his orbit, even if he did not know how to lead. She had not realized Mondul had recalled the military tumens of warriors he sent south, but she could never allow Satai to know he had left her out of that piece of politics. It would make her appear weak and possibly strip away some of the power and authority she had over the women in Monke Bulag. It is unseemly for women to discuss such things over tea, Mandukai said carefully. There must have been some truth to the rumor, or it wouldn't have been worth repeating. But Mandukai did not know the extent of how many would return. She made a mental note to speak to Mandul about it later. Being surprised like this made their marriage appear weak. What does it matter? Joghan asked as if sensing Mandukai's dilemma. Your husband is here already, as are ours. Is Zuni coming back? Asige sat up straighter, with the eagerness of a child on her youthful face. She adored the Orlok, much as a girl adored her father, perhaps more. His training had never been lost on her, and before he had left on this mission, he had given Asige a new bow to strengthen her arm then taught her how to fire from horseback in that breath of a moment when all hooves were off the ground. He had also given his dog, Kilgore, to her care. Asige had taken care of Kilgore as if it were her sacred duty. Mandukai scowled at Asige's reaction, but the girl only shrank back a fraction. Yes, Satai said, and rumor has it the Golden Prince will remain behind. Mandukai breathed a small sigh of relief at that. While she did not like Bayon gathering so much power and support so far from home, she was pleased he had been sent somewhere far away from Yeke. While she had never caught the two of them in the act, she suspected they were having an affair behind Mondul's back. She also never forgot what Bayon had done to Nergui. Unabulid had uncovered the truth, that Bayon had murdered her Angut guard. However, they did not have enough evidence to bring this truth to Mondul and convince him, nor did they understand why Bayon did it. Instead of accusing Bayon of murder, Mandukai held her vengeance close to her heart. One day, she would see justice done, when the time was right. You mustn't put too much trust in rumors, Satai, Mandukai said as she sat down her cup. 
It's dangerous to spread the wrong ones. Joghan cocked her head to the side and studied Mandukai. So, he is returning? Satai asked. I'm afraid some matters of state are not mine to divulge. Mandukai responded, pleased with her ability to evade answers without making herself appear ignorant. He can stay away as far as I'm concerned, Isige said briskly into her cup. Mandukai slapped her, drawing a wounded expression from the girl as she rubbed her cheek. He is your future great Khan and your kin. Do not speak ill of your kin. For just a moment, Mandukai felt bad for admonishing Isige. When the two of them were alone, she allowed Isige to speak freely. But the girl needed to learn that such things were for the privacy of the gear, and not to be spoken around others. Insulting the Golden Prince in front of anyone could get her into serious trouble. Esige lifted her chin defiantly and straightened her back as Satai cast a satisfied, smug smile in her direction. Joghan dipped her head toward her cup to lessen Esige's humiliation. I'm sorry, mother, Esige murmured. After tea, Mandukai excused herself from the others and went in search of Mandul. She could not afford to be surprised like that again. If something was happening, she needed to know about it. Mandul had not been difficult to find. He sat atop his throne in the gathering tent, reviewing reports that had come in over the past few days. As Mandukai entered, he lifted his gaze to hers and smiled briefly before returning to his task. Mandukai approached the dais and settled in her chair a step below his, waiting patiently for him to finish reading a report. You wait for something, wife, Mandul said, staring at the paper. Out with it. Did you recall the southern Tumans? Mandul sighed, and the sigh turned into a cough that shook his whole body. He didn't stop until one of the serving girls brought him a cup of irog to wet his throat. Mandukai's brows drew together as she watched him hack. Are you well? Fine. Mandul waved a hand and leaned back in his throne, gulping down breaths. Just had some dirt caught in my throat from my walk this morning. Mandukai wanted to believe him, but the vision came back, the words of Genghis Khan echoing in her mind. He is no Khan. Don't look at me like I'm a wounded animal, Mandul grumbled. I said it's nothing. As Mandul gulped down air, she swore she heard him wheezing. A bit of dirt wouldn't cause such a reaction, would it? You asked about the Tumans, he said, changing the subject. Yes, I recalled all but enough to protect Bolku on his mission. I need them here. What is more urgent than the uprising against the Ming? Mandukai asked, taking his cup and setting it aside to shift closer. You haven't told me something. What troubles you? Mandul scowled and waved a paper at her. This! It's the third report within six months of the Oirat gathering together. They are up to something, and I need Isama to help. Isama. His name sent a shiver down Mandukai's spine. He had arrived in Monke Bulag on Biggerson's orders one year ago and quickly landed himself into position as the vice-chancellor. Isama was certainly a clever man, more so than Biggerson. Something about Isama sent Mandukai on edge. Mandul had been quick to accept the man's confidence. Too quick. Isama had established a bond of trust with Mandul, and a friendship with Bayon that Mandukai found unnerving. Yet... She could discern no good reason for these feelings, other than her gut instincts. Isama was respectful to her, to everyone, and she had learned he was the only other person at court as intelligent as her in thinking things through. She should be grateful for his arrival, yet she couldn't shake that discomfort. You fear an Oirat attack, Mandukai surmised. Mandul nodded bitterly. Payback. 
for our attacks on them. Attacks I warned you and Bolku both against. Mondul slapped his hand against the armrest. Now isn't the time for your self-righteous unbraiding. His voice rolled off the felt walls. I would rather see this end without more fighting, and I need Isama to do so. So, he's the only one you've recalled. Mondul rubbed his forehead and shoved the stack of papers at her. No, Bolku will continue his work. The rest are to return. He does not need them anymore. Activity along the border has increased. Bolku is doing as I asked. Mandukai gathered the papers, but her reading skills remained minimal. She couldn't understand most of what he laid in her hands, despite the lessons she had undertaken. She needed to learn how to read, and quickly. The news that stuck in her heart was not regarding the Oirat or the border mission, but that she would see Unabullet again. Their parting had been distant, as most of their interactions with each other had been since losing their child. Perhaps he sensed a change in her, or maybe she sensed a difference in him. Unabullet had distanced himself from her after the miscarriage, except when he shared the evidence implicating Bayon and Nergui's murder. After that, he had volunteered to lead raids, hunting parties, and scouting expeditions. So many that, in the last three years, they had hardly seen each other. At first, Mandukai assumed Mandul suspected something and was trying to keep them apart. But then, she overheard Unabullet insisting fervently on leading another expedition in Mandul's name. She knew the fault did not fall on her husband. Unabullet avoided her. If you enjoyed this sample, click the links in the description to hear more. Do you want free audiobooks, ebooks, or autographed paperbacks? Join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash szdavies underscore character assassin. You'll gain access to my Discord server, behind-the-scenes updates, merch, and so much more.